In this episode, I'm once again joined by Beth Upton, meditation teacher, ex-nun, and student of renowned meditation master Pa Ork Sayadaw. Beth shares her emphasis on meditation with the natural rhythms of the body and reveals how she deals with students who experience low motivation, psychological challenges, and even psychosis as a result of meditation practice. Beth also discusses her own relationship difficulties after disrobing as a nun, why she embarked on special communication trainings to address them, and explains why erotic feeling diminishes as one becomes more enlightened. So without further ado, Beth Upton. Beth Upton, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so pleased to be talking with you again. Our first uh, episode together was very popular indeed and uh, much discussed. So, was it? Uh, right. Yes, actually. Oh. <laughs> Is that what you say to all of, the, to all of your podcast guests? Are you accusing me of using a uh, stock line uh, on you for the, <laughs> yes. the opening of this sequel, Beth Upton? <laughs> yes. Your wisdom eye is strong. <laughs> <laughs> Dharma bullshit detector. Okay. Well, actually, no, it's, it was uh, much discussed and, and very popular. So um, that's actually true um, in this case. Well, um, <laughs> I hear that you were just mentioning to me, in fact, before we began, that you're involved right now in a fundraiser for your intentional community in Spain. Perhaps you could say a little bit about this community and about how's that project going? I think we discussed it a bit, actually, um, the seed of that idea in the last episode. So perhaps you we, could bring us up to date with that. Yeah, so the backstory in a nutshell is like eight years ago when I was still a nun at that time, I founded loosely founded a community in some caves on the outskirts of Almeria in Spain and when I arrived there it was like I don't want to speak bad about these people but anyway like drug addicts <laughs> and petty criminals who were living there and then gradually gradually they started to change started to meditate and it became a meditation community and then some of my friends went other monastics went and Eight years later, that community is still going, but we don't own the caves and we can't. We're effectively squatting them. And so now as our community is growing, we need to buy some land and like enter the adult stage of this community, become official. So that's what we're doing at the moment. We're doing a fundraiser. It's a first round fundraiser for this project of buying some land in Granada. And... It's got really, I think, really solid core values. So we run the whole community purely by dana. There's no charge for anything in harmony with the environment. Meditation is the priority. There's an emphasis on deep practice. And then anyone's welcome, as long as you keep our rules. And what are the rules? There's not very many, but it's just our veto power, right? Like if you say anyone's welcome, then there has to be a boundary. There's not very many rules. I'm not a disciplinarian. And what's the name of this community? And uh, uh, where can people find out about it and perhaps contribute to your efforts? It's called Sanditika. And the website is sanditika.org. And I don't know, maybe you can put a link somewhere. I don't know. Mm. But sanditika.org. And the fundraiser is there on that website. And so far, it's going quite well. I feel we put like way more work than we needed to, I think, into a fundraiser. We've never done one before, but um, yeah, I don't know. I feel really happy to see people contributing to this thing. It's really beautiful. Growing sense of community. Very interesting. I'm curious how, how it's modeled life there. Uh, it's actually one of the things I want to ask you a bit about is different um, modes of living you could say in terms of how, how one organizes one's life it's a question i have for you because of course you spent 10 years as a nun five of which under the tutelage of the great power Xeodol, master of, of meditation and buddhist doctrine and uh now of course you're not a nun um anymore i'm not right so that's that's quite a change so it's something i'd like to ask you about um some specifics about that we did discuss a bit of it last time but how is the uh, community life there modeled is it modeled in a sort of monastic sense are people when they're living there following kind of monastic 
uh, loosely monastic approach to living? Uh, what about the day-to-day -day schedule? What about the diet, etc.? How are these sorts of things organized? Yeah, so when I arrived there, I was still a nun, but I was like a nun who bust out of park. So I, I loved my monastic life, and I also wanted to find a way at that time in my monastic life to lead my monastic life in a bit less of an institutional way. As a nun in Asia, we weren't allowed to go for alms in the village, also because Park Monastery is bigger than Park Village, I think, so it wasn't feasible for everybody to go for alms. But there as a monastic, I would just go into town and beg my food at the market and we live next to a local gypsy community and they support us a lot. Um, and then I, in my meditation practice, I like as little structure as possible. I like to be able to just meditate my natural rhythm, take a nap when I want. Um, it's keeping the rules around, you know, when we should eat and when we shouldn't eat. But apart from that, just very, very free and putting in as little structure as possible. And the first, I think, 15 months or something like that that I was there, it was just me, the nun, and then these, like, aging hippies and drug takers. And that's really when I started to teach, was when I was there before that I hadn't really done any teaching. And I saw, oh, wait, like, this works. I, I don't need all of this and Burmese hierarchy in order for the Dharma to be effective. So when the community there started to grow, I approached it. If I'm going to shine it in a flattering light, I could say a little like how the Buddha approached the monastic community when he was setting it up in that I made the rules only when necessary. So just like the minimum structure necessary, like we all eat lunch at the same time. We do a group sit 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And other than that really you're very very free there and I've seen that and that freedom has been quite transformative for a lot of people but as we grow more we might need to bring in more necessary structure it might be like that but I'm not a lover of rules for their own sake that's very intriguing I wonder um if you could say something a bit about this idea of meditating with one's natural rhythm of course mm. um well perhaps you could say something about that i think uh, this uh, meditating t according to certain uh, regime uh, spe especially i think in in europe and america perhaps when one thinks of meditation retreats and thinks of the meditation schedule you get up at a certain time and you're in the meditation hall or whatever the case may be and then there are sort of segments of meditation throughout the day probably a sermon at some point also maybe with some Q&A, and then, of course, meal times and so on. So it's pretty structured, I think, most group retreats. As you pointed out, groups tend to demand that, um, uh, it seems, but maybe not. So I'm curious if you could say something about, on an individual level anyway, as an individual practitioner meditating with one's own natural rhythm. Yes, yeah, so I should say also on my retreats, now I'm leading mostly month-long month retreats, and I also keep the schedule very, very loose. Almost the whole day is unstructured meditation time. And we have two compulsory group sits in the day that I put there just for smooth running of the group. Like sometimes I need to be able to speak to everybody all at the same time. And the meal times are fixed. Everything else is optional. Um, and I find it gets the best out of the meditators. And what we've find usually as people find for themselves oh that's the time of the day when my mind's naturally sharp oh I, i'm not naturally very mindful at 5 30 a.m but at 3 p.m after i digested my lunch then i'm really sharp or the other way around whatever it might be and um, but it allows people to relax into the practice and they're not fighting um i think especially for developing samadhi and also if you're practicing vipassana in the way of it being like an absorbed state, there's so much surrender involved that if you're putting unnecessary rigidity in the mind, it's counterproductive. Um, and 
on retreats, it might be different. I'm not, I'll, we'll wait and see. It might be different if we scale a community and people are there long term. But on retreats, usually people are over motivated. You know, they've worked so long to get this time off work and they know they've only got a month and they're over, over motivated. I don't need to tell them to sit. They're definitely going to practice. So it's like surplus to requirement. And for me as a meditator, if I do my own retreat, then I throw out the clock. And I just, especially now I can eat whenever I want. So I just throw out the clock and I eat when I'm hungry, I sleep when I'm tired and I meditate the rest of the time. And it's like free, free surrender to the Dharma. What was it like at Powalk in that regard? Uh, I understand that you'd often, after breakfast, leave the compound and go into the uh, jungle. How do you know that? Uh, I do research before these things. <laughs> <laughs> and you I go remember into... this from last time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, seems, it seems only polite to do a bit of research before interviewing somebody. Right, but, but how um, did you find that out? You like call up my friends or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course you've spoken about it publicly. That's the only way I could know about that. But oh. you go off into the jungle for some, you know, the whole day, uh, meditate to meditate in an extended way, un undisturbed. So I guess there was that possibility even at Pawok. But what was the sort of regime there? Was it was it uh, quite structured or? Yeah, it was definitely more structured. So I think there was. Five. I can't really remember. I can't really remember the daily schedule at Parks. I didn't keep it, but there was a, a daily schedule of structured sittings. But the community there is really big. It's like more than a thousand people. So if there's one or two who are doing their own thing, they usually don't mind too much. Hmm. And so I did that. I think they were usually pretty okay as well with people meditating their own schedule in their room or something like that. When one thinks of a sort of open natural rhythm, free schedule, like the one you're describing. I, I can imagine some objections to that or some what ifs, at least. Of course, the, the benefits I think you've described very, very clearly. What if one finds oneself coming onto one of these natural, more open schedules and not practicing much, just sleeping or finding oneself in a funk? And um, I've heard that some people find a more rigorous structure for example, in a Zen retreat, style tends to be more rigorous, right? Almost every minute in certain Zen retreats, as, as one example, is not the only kind, uh, is accounted for. It's a different training method, I guess. What would you say to that if people are falling into a kind of deflation or uh, the body clock's going out of whack and there's, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and not much practice getting done? Is that something you've seen happen or that um, might happen? Uh, I'd say it happens for most of the people, actually, in the first two, three days of retreat, and it's good. People arrive really tired and it's not that tiredness isn't there to be power on through it's there to tell you to rest rest and you know this simile like when we start meditating it's like cleaning out a dirty cloth and at first you just see all the dirt coming out and oftentimes people arrive to retreat exhausted full of unprocessed emotion just needing to wind down and if you don't force them if you allow them to rest and sleep for a couple of days once they've slept they meditate much better because their minds all released all of this junk their bodies are naturally full of natural energy and yeah so it does happen but um i see it as good that they go through that process and it can become destructive if they are chronically unmotivated unmotivated to meditate it doesn't happen often because, like I said, they chose to come to a meditation retreat. So then that's my job as a teacher. You know, if I see them really just like stuck in a hole and on the retreats, I teach everybody one on one. So usually I pick up on those things. But going through a few days of lethargy and, and needing to rest is, is normal. I definitely do that on my personal retreats, I usually sleep heavily for the first couple of days. That's interesting. And how do you typically, I expect it's somewhat individual, but how do you typically engage with somebody like that who's in a funk, maybe lacking motivation, or at least has lost touch with the motivation that brought them there? How would you um, talk to somebody or work with somebody who's in that position? Yeah, it is really individual. 
just through imagination, I think what I would probably first check for is emotional blocks and just the magic power of empathy. You know, just like get to know them and find out what's going on with them. And usually I think that's that's enough. So there might be some case where there's some um, Dharma trauma or like the way that I phrase something is, you know, triggered something. People have had bad experiences with religion, bad experiences with authority, bad experiences with a certain method or a certain way that a question is answered. And it's triggered something in them like, oh no, this practice isn't, I'm not going there. And then just talk about it, figure it out. Can you think of any examples of specific examples of Dharma trauma? Um, I think we spoke about this one a lot the last time, if I'm remembering the right conversation, but the main one is people that have been trained in making too much effort. And they've done like a lot of striving, forcing. Um, it's been very goal orientated. They feel frustrated, disappointed. And then I'm really trying my best to frame things in a different way. But I might say something like, um, you know, Nibbana is the goal or something like that. And they, oh, no, I'm never going to get there. Oh, here we go again. I'm afraid. That's the main one that comes up. But it might be other things like um, it being implied that they should believe things that aren't yet their own direct experience is a big one, which isn't really Dharma, but it's, it's often sort of in there. Um, and then I have to reassure, you know, you don't need to believe in these things. Um, sometimes if people misunderstand the way that karma is being explained, they can hear it through a lens of conceit, which can make them feel worse. Like being blamed for their own suffering or something like that. There are a few little things that come up. None of it is insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Very interesting indeed. And I suppose I might ask another question that springs naturally from this. I wasn't necessarily planning to ask you these questions, but it's very interesting. When you're on these longer retreats, uh, sometimes it's, it's said, or it, it can happen in any retreat, I think, but certainly a longer retreat, that sometimes somebody might go through uh, tough time, psychological oh, yeah. material. Usually, yeah. Right, might come <laughs> up and so on. And you, you're probably aware, maybe maybe you're not, that there are um, movements, I suppose, of uh, report and care for those who've had these sorts of uh, experiences. Uh, I'm thinking of, say, Cheetah House, uh, Willoughby Britain. Um, she's an academic who's been talking about, if you want, the dangers of uh, meditation. In, in the sense in, in the sense that we're discussing now. Are you able to spot that sort of thing coming? Um, if you're meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, can you see it coming? Or um, how do you deal with it when it's arising? Do you have people just desperate to leave all of a sudden when they meet, meet this sort of material or act Quite out often, in strange yeah. ways? <laughs> have, you ever had any, have you ever had any psychosis, for example, or other um, mental fractures with, with, with consensus reality, for example, you know, I'm curious about that. So I think it's, it's normal that people go through a difficult time when we're purifying our minds. It's not a bad thing. This is, it's not a necessary part of the process, but it's a very common part of the process for most people because we're turning up our awareness on reality. So anything in our own reality or the external reality that we haven't yet accepted is at some point it's going to hit our awareness and we've got some work to do. So it's normal that people struggle on a long retreat and that's why I'm there to guide them through it, to like be, be by their side as I guide them through it, and reassure them and show them their strength and be there by their side. As for um, so how I deal with it, I, I, I love them. I, I love them and I teach them. And as for um, psychosis, so 
I've had a couple of instances of psychosis on retreat, people with pre-existing psychosis who we allowed to do the retreat. And it was really positive, actually, um, in both the cases that I'm thinking of. It was a really beautiful experience. And one of those practitioners practiced very, very deeply in 10 days. And at the end of the retreat, she explained to me that because of the deep meditation, she could see the mental habit in herself, how she was subtly clinging. To, the psych to that process of going into psychosis, how she was feeding it and like the ego states underneath it. And the other one wasn't quite so deep, but still a really positive experience. Um, so yeah, no big problems there, but I think I don't mean this to like toot my own horn, but it depends on the skill of the teacher. I spent my whole adult life absorbed in the world of meditators and advanced practice and seen this, these kinds of things many, many hundreds of times. Um, I think like if you just maybe like done a few retreats or something, then it, it, you might feel a little bit, I don't know, on shaky ground. With, sometimes the emotional releases that come up are really like strong and you know, powerful, painful states and huge fear and stuff like that. But, it, it's, but ultimately, it's just fear. Could you imagine a way in which a less skillful teacher might put a foot wrong there uh, in, 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 in the event of a strong emotional state coming up, for instance, or, you know, psychosis or something like that? I mean, having seen those things, I presume at Powell, you saw that sort of thing is where you, where you saw that a lot. Um, and you have a, it sounds like a sort of confidence that's come from having seen those things occur and be presumably resolved or work with in that context yeah. and that you're carrying it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So also because at, at Park Oak, so again, it was a huge community, so so much diversity and people from all around the world. And we only ever learned in group interview. So whenever we went to learn, we were seeing the practice of everybody else also being held by the teacher. It was a very, very rich learning environment for learning how to teach as well, which was not my intention at the time, but now I'm really grateful for it. And I think just if the teacher isn't maintaining their own wholesome state, if the teacher loses their balance and they go into their own fear response or their own ego response or their own whatever it might be, savior response, or they are afraid or they start worrying about getting sued or something, <laughs> then the student's going to feel it like, oh, there's a problem, I'm a problem. But they're not a problem, they're just experiencing reality and that's what the Dharma is about. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does, yeah. That's very interesting. The uh, acting in anticipation of future litigation, <laughs> and covering of one's... one's um, Zafu, maybe we could say. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, that's that's certainly a thing. What do you, what do you think of that? Is I that never thought about state? it at all. I never thought about it until I went to America this year, and then it's sort of all like creeping in through the sides. This like litigious culture, and I think, why have they, why have they written like a whole long document on, I don't know, how to be inclusive or something? Oh, that's why. Why do they have a policy about this? And, Oh, that's why it's, I never frame things like that coming from Myanmar and then starting a community that we're squatting caves in Spain with no health and safety. Um, yeah, I think it's not, it's not so much the culture that I grew up in where we all sue each other. What about you? It doesn't happen in England so much, does it, that people sue each other? Perhaps not as much, but... The principle, I think, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be suing, I think. That's an example of what might happen if someone looks back at an experience um, or others look back at, at the way something was handled and find fault with it. it suing isn't the only thing that can come from that. Um, there could be other things that can come oh, from right. that. So there can be a like sense... criticism, criticism or... Yes, I suppose, yeah, criticism of various kinds, yeah. 
It's interesting because um, attempting to do the right thing and attempting to be seen to do the right thing so that if it's examined later, it appears to be right, or at least not. One can't be caught out on it, uh, are two separate things. And I think yeah. one of the things you're pointing to is that the attempt to appear to have done the right thing procedurally can sometimes lead one to act in a way that prob makes a problem of the person who's having a problem. Uh, yeah. And it, it, one in attempting to do the right thing, perhaps um, at the cost or the expense of the person in front of you. It seems like right. you're, you're saying something like that. Does that, does that uh, inspire anything? Yes, and also just you can't go into the life of a Dharma teacher expecting not to get criticised. <laughs> that would just be really, really foolish. That's, that's, that's the game, though. Like, a lot of people are going to criticise. A lot of people aren't going to like what you say. The Dharma is an offensive message anyone's teaching style isn't going to be right for everybody and that's really like that's what you sign up for is being unpopular with a lot of people and and that's okay and I think the way that I approach that is I'm very transparent with my students in the Q&A they can ask me any personal question that they want and um, I very openly show my own defilements so it's really clear I'm not trying to mislead anybody. And if you want to learn from me, great, stay. And if you don't, I really, I, I wish you the best that you find a teacher that works for you and go and learn from them. And yeah, like that's what we do. We take the criticism and then we you know, support the ones that we can. That would be nice. If I was approaching this job thinking, how can I make sure nobody dislikes me? I'm not sure I would be able to sleep at night because we have to give that unpleasing beneficial truth so often. We have to give the truth that people don't want to hear so often. I wonder if there's a balance point. Of course, we're talking about now, um, you're talking about it, um, an attempt to avoid criticism or litigation uh, affecting negatively. I think litigation right? is different. Like I would do the necessary things to avoid undue litigation. Yeah. Like if I was living in a culture where I thought I'm going to get sued for anything, I'd also write some kind of a policy to cover my back because it's a nightmare. It's a drain on time and resources to get sued. But it's a different thing, the general attitude towards being liked, if you like. But I interrupted your question. Well, no, that's interesting. Um, you, I think you may have anticipated it. One of the ways, I suppose, that things can go wrong, it seems you're saying, is to be excessively concerned with being liked or being right or seen to be right. Um, you, you admit that you'll... Uh, honor the threat of litigation in advance, but unless uh, appearing to, you know, wanting to be appear to be right, uh, wanting to be seen to be right and so on. Another extreme that seems to have occurred sometimes is the guru or the teacher who is so unconcerned with societal feedback or community feedback that um, they act if you want in ways that cause uh, scandals at the very least. Let me not put a moral judgment on it, but at the very least, the scandal, I think, is an objective fact. So due to their, if you want, willingness not to be liked or freedom from um, the need, to, fr freedom from the restraining force of, um, of, of, of the superego, <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I'm grasping around here because I'm asking you the question, really. What do you think of yeah, that? Do you so, see that as a, possible, as a possible risk? Yeah, so like how we don't become like Osho or something. Um, yeah, so I think maybe the two main ingredients, one I already said is transparency. So a lot of scandal comes when the defilements are hidden and it's like something else is behind the curtain. So... I, 
like I said, I didn't start teaching until I arrived at the caves. And the reason was the only model I'd seen for teaching was my teachers who were in this patriarchal model of showing up to the teaching room as the teacher presenting an image of something like perfection. And I had very good teachers, so there wasn't anything particularly ugly behind, but we also didn't really see the whole person. And I had a feeling like that's a really lonely life for me and I don't want to do that. And also it's, it's subtly dishonest and I'd rather be fully human with my students. And I hadn't found the way to do that until I arrived at the caves and then I was like free and I was squatting my cave and I was begging my food and I was friends with the people in the other caves and they knew me, they saw me every day and they wanted to learn from me. And I taught them as a friend and we'd have a cup of tea and we'd speak about our lives and I saw it worked and that's when I really relaxed into teaching. So I think transparency is a huge piece. And then the other one, of course, which should go without saying, is a genuine inclination towards dharma it's a genuine wish to deepen the understanding of the dharma to the person in front of you if that's not there and you're actually wishing to i don't know get them to give you lots of money or get them to sleep with you or something then there's going to be a scandal but yeah i don't know i think i hope i'm not naive i'm still like a beginning teacher but I, I, in my experience so far, if I maintain transparency and I really care about their Dharma practice, they might still dislike me or I'm trying to get them to see something they don't want to see or personalities don't vibe or whatever. That's okay. Go and find somebody else. But I don't see that it can go horribly wrong in the way like a cult could. Very interesting. Thank you. Mm. Well, that's, uh, could you say once again, the name of the center? of the uh, community sanditika meditation community yeah sanditika. Mm -hmm. the other thing actually i didn't say about that community i'm really excited about is um that we make it in harmony with the nature so we're building everything and like permaculture principles and um, like doing eco building and this is one like new aspect of dharma that interests me is like how I learned a lot about sort of dharma in relationships since I disrobed and did like a lot of conscious relating practice. And, and this, I feel is like my next growing edge, how we bring the dharma into the relationship with the surroundings. Because something feels to me intuitively off when you're meditating deeply and you're in like a very luxurious, like energy consuming thing. It feels a bit jarring or something like we know it's not quite right um I, d I don't have all the answers there but this interests me a lot the learning of it yeah sorry i went off on a tangent well actually once again you've anticipated one of the threads that i was hoping to no. pick up with you did yeah. i really, <laughs> <You> really <did. laughs> through zoom as well i'm on form <laughs> mm -hmm. and um that thread is about relationship, actually. Um, of course, in monk life, and can we say lay life? Would that be would that be a fair way to yeah, say? How would you I rather categorize can it? Say that. I don't, I don't mind. Non monk life or non 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 non, non life. Non non life lay life. Non, non, yeah. yeah. Well, normal life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you have your monastic. Um, Vinaya and the way you live as a monastic. <clears throat> and then a lot of those things, in theory at least, become possible, if not, not oblig obligatory, of course, but possible uh, after you come out of that. And I was, I was curious about that uh, side of things. Across really a, the whole spectrum, as much as you're willing to talk about or you think it's interesting to talk about, one thing in particular I was uh, curious about was, well, first of all, I'm curious about that adjustment. And in particular, You've talked about the 32 body part meditation in, in your YouTube channel. You know, it's one of the, one of the methods that you uh, teach in certain circumstances to certain people. And um, other meditation methods to do with focusing on the disgusting, uh, mm. specifically or revolting, uh, 
other words used, parts of the body. Um, and from what I understand, but please correct me if I'm wrong, part of that is to induce a sort of disenchantment with that uh, identification with the body or cherishing of the body uh, that's you know, part, part of this liberation process. Um, right. I've also heard it said that one of the effects of that is to reduce, should we say, sexual desire or erotic, erotic desire of various kinds, which of course, as a monastic, uh, presumably is advantageous because monastics are, as, as far as I'm aware, celibate uh, by, by a vow. When one leaves a monastic context, um, I'm wondering what happens then? Is there a hangover from such meditations, a kind of revulsion or a sense of yeah, revulsion or repulsion from you know, other people in a physical sense? Or, uh, well, seeing as so much, it seems, of erotic connection and relational connection in that domain is based on self-cherishing, objectification, projection, etc., etc., craving, maybe. That's often a propelling force in these relationships. What's relationship like when that's not there? Uh, I'm curious about that. But, of course, it's rather personal. Um, so, that's all right. Mm. You can ask me about Dharma in my sex life. Yes fine um so sometimes i give this simile like imagine you only ever ate in mcdonald's and so for you you just thought that was like good food <laughs> and you might i don't know prefer the chicken nuggets over the big mac or something but basically your whole world is mcdonald's and then the Buddha comes along and he's like, McDonald's is terrible. It's awful. And you're like, but this is all that feeds me. I love it. You can get a really cheap ice cream. And then most people won't listen. And a few people will. And they will follow the Buddha down the road. And they're like, but now we're just on a road. There's no food. And then eventually they will arrive at a really good restaurant, Michelin-starred restaurant or whatever, with the Buddha. And knowing the Michelin-starred restaurant, they don't feel much need to go back to McDonald's because they've got something better. But they're also not scared of it. They also don't hate it. They have a disenchanted relationship to McDonald's. And if they get a nostalgic longing for a Big Mac, so be it. They'll go and have one, but they won't stay there long because they know something better. It's a very different state being in that transcended state, being in the Michelin starred restaurant. It's a very different state to being the person who is cold and hungry, standing outside the McDonald's, but too scared, too proud, too idealistic to go in. And so I think when we Hear the Buddha's teachings on sex or the 32 parts, we can misunderstand that it's telling us, don't you dare go into McDonald's. Like, don't you dare go in there, it's bad for you, it's suffering. And it's a misunderstanding of what the Buddha is saying. When we practice 32 parts, there's no aversion. We're not cultivating aversion. We're just clearly seeing it's like you're in McDonald's and you're reading the ingredients and you're like, whoa. It's to help us disenchant and find something better not to cultivate aversion towards the body and when we're in that transcended state where we're in, when we're in the disenchanted state it's a much more open more loving more inclusive state we've expanded ourselves and so when we do come back down to mcdonald's we're there with much less need much more greed we can savor it for what it is we don't need to feel so much clinging and holding on to it because there's something better waiting for us so we can have the moment, enjoy it, let it go, not take it too seriously. And so my experience has been that my Dharma practice has improved my sex life and improved my relationships in general because all of that, I was quite young when I ordained. So I was still like in my early 20s, that age when maybe well, I'll just speak for myself, still had 
insecurity and all of that kind of thing um like not so confident in my body or not so confident in vocalizing clearly um like my boundaries and things like that and now it's nothing for me to do that so my dharma practice improved not just my sexual relationships all of my relationships yeah does that answer the question yes it's very interesting indeed <laughs> M- might i probe further on the subject Go on. yeah the there are some views that i've heard expressed that suggest as one traverses towards liberation through these various different um, stages and watershed moments, stream entry and once returner and so on and so forth, etc. Um, to take one model, that actually the capacity for sexual response is reduced, so that one of the marks of somebody in those later paths is um, an inability to or um, sexually function actually yeah yeah they say this about the non-returner the third stage or fourth stage enlightened person i don't know i'm not there but intuitively that feels right to me it's like you're so much in this better place lose the inclination to go back and in the third stage of enlightenment all sense craving is removed without remainder so to go into that sexual relationship, you need to pick up some craving. You need to pick up some sense of wanting, even if you're leading with like love and metta and connection and union, you still need some wanting something, I think, to get that sexual urge going. So I can believe it, but I'll confirm it when I'm there. Well, and I'm curious. If some sort of craving is required to, as you say, get the sexual urge going, um, presumably being in a relationship with a person who's heading in that direction would be, uh, and maybe all relationships go this way anyway, <laughs> with enough time, you know, would be a kind of, um, if, if their practice is going well, a reduction of one of the key elements of the relationship. Um, as the craving is, is decreased, if the, if the practice is going well, I imagine that that would be something that would happen. Um, presumably, that would be a sort of ticking time bomb for physical intimacy um, between mm-hmm. partners if they're following this path. And then eventually, I suppose, celibacy would become an inevitability. So what you've got to remember is we're moving into a better state. So it's not like a ticking time bomb. You're both going to be happier and it's why, like when you're in that more connected, more loving, more blissful way of relating together, you think, should we go and get a Big Mac? No, but you don't feel like you've lost out. You're in a transcended state. It's not a repressive state. It's not an aversive state towards sex. And yeah, I don't know. All I can say is I've found that the Dharma is really improved my relationship a lot lot it's improved my relationship with myself also which obviously like brings more skill in relation to others but just my capacity to connect and be open and to not bring so much self and so much craving and clinging into the way that i relate to others what do you think of um practices in say tantric buddhism to do with using the desire of um, sex or using the sexual uh, union anyway to as a sort of vehicle for meditation as a meditation in itself actually to uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of those sorts of practices what do you think of that sort of thing one might find say in tantric buddhism uh, completion stage practices of the vajrayana for example i don't know enough about the details to really comment but what i will say is through some of my students I learned about like Kundalini practices that I haven't done, but they've done and they've told me about it in detail and I teach them and I know the details of how their mind and body works. And so what I learned through them is that 
I think of it as like two ways up a mountain. And the way that I learned is you concentrate your mind. So you deepen samadhi if you like. And when you do that, you can ignore the body and all different types of blocks in the, in the body automatically release themselves. And I understand that process, that concentrated mind is producing materiality throughout the body. And it's like, if you soak a tense muscle in warm water and it releases, you're bathing the body in beautiful materiality, you get all types of energetic release happening as the practice deepens. So in the way that I learned, concentration or samadhi is like the practice and energetic release is the result. What? I saw through some of my students who had done good quality Kundalini practice, their practice had been releasing energy in the body. And I didn't teach them that. They learned that from a Kundalini master. And they had focused on all types of blocks and they had done that. And then they came to do a retreat with me and then in like 10 days, they were already in the fifth jhana. So concentration is the result. And through them I came to understand oh right these things are like yeah like two sides of the same coin so I haven't done those tantric practices in detail and I also haven't met anyone who teaches them well and has explained to me the detail I know just through culture through general culture and hearsay um but I imagine it's something similar that if it's a really well-attuned sexual relationship, you get so much feedback on where you're blocked. You see yourself so clearly through the lens of that sexual relationship. You can clear out a lot of stuff. It's one of the benefits of relationship in general and of sexual relationships, like a heightened version of that. And then maybe if it's done with skill, it can be, yeah, like an unblocker. The mind concentrates more easily, but that's my best guess anyway you should ask a tantra master very interesting thank you i'm curious what your involvement with um did you say conscious relating authentic relating was yeah i did loads of um loads of different relational practices or whatever i could get my hands on for a couple of years because i noticed that when i came out of monastic life that side of me was a bit underdeveloped because I'd been associating with like the same genre of people for 10 years and all the conversations were very much the same. And um, I was used to people, we were all able to intuit other people's boundaries and not overstep the mark and everyone was very kind. So I had some catching up to do. So I probably more than I could remember right now, relational techniques I learned and then learned to facilitate and um, it was it was really helpful, like building a new skill set. Those relational techniques, of which there are many, usually aren't taught in a Dharma context, but because I was learning them through the lens of Dharma, when I started to facilitate them, I taught them in a Dharma way. And I'd, I often recommend people to do these things because especially in the daily life, I see that oftentimes I'm teaching, I meet people on retreat and I teach them for a month then they want to continue their practice in the daily life. And there's a whole new skill set to learn of continuing to deepen or maintain the practice in the daily life. And very often the thing which knocks people's practice down again and again is um, something's happened relationally. And sometimes it's an unavoidable catastrophe or like someone suddenly died or... Um, their partners cheated on them or whatever, something unavoidable. But with some people you see, oh, this is a chronic relational problem that you have and it's not going to be solved through sitting alone. You have to learn a new way of communicating, a new way of being honest or asserting yourself or something. And then this pattern in you that's disturbing your meditation will fall away. And it's another reason why I'm putting so much energy into building community because I see now I've got a few years behind me of leading long retreats. I see the limit to people's Dharma practice, practicing only ever in the context of silent retreat, the whole relational side of the practice and having themselves mirrored back by others and learning really like the Brahma in practice and 
so many things that come from community that you can't get on a silent retreat. It feels unsustainable for me to keep on leading silent retreats and like second best for the practitioners. Could you perhaps give an example or two of the sort of relational issues or patterns that might arise and disturb someone's meditation practice? And perhaps the meditator would think, gosh, I just need to meditate harder or meditate through this or transcend this somehow through my meditation. And, and you'd actually perhaps advocate, um, no, you have to deal with this slightly differently. Could you think of uh, one or two examples of that? Yeah. So, for example, if people are chronically resentful or angry or passive aggressive or victimy, which it's all like a similar flavor. And because they haven't boundaried themselves, they haven't advocated for themselves well enough in relationships. They don't know how. They've learned maybe that it's like spiritually incorrect to say this is what I need or I can't do that. Um, that's one example that comes to mind. Um, hmm, what else? When you asked me the question, I had another one that's fallen from my mind now. Um, but loads of things. Loads of things come up in relation. And um, maybe projection. So like if people are feeling consistently disappointed by others or let down or um, you know, other people haven't done what they thought they should do, this kind of thing. And oftentimes they're just like project like habitually projecting what they want onto others. This is also a relational issue. Um, shame is a big one things that people carry huge shame around things and it just eats away at them when they're meditating the sense of being unlovable and shame is melted away by loving relation it's another it's another relational skill to build that it's very difficult to solve just through sitting alone practicing metta to yourself because the belief remains i, I might love this but no one else will and we create like a sad, sad, lonely meditator. Many, many things. Which modalities did you train to facilitate in? Um, a few. So different types of um, circling, MVC, um, different types of like, authentic relating games and things like that. There's lots of different options out there. Yeah some of which I liked more than others. I think of all of the techniques I like, maybe this is just my personality. I like very stripped back circling techniques. So there's very few, very little structure. And sometimes, some people really like a lot of structure in these relational forms. MVC, for example, where there's like literally step-by-step -step how you articulate yourself. But for me, I prefer, when I facilitate relational practices usually, I try and hold values of truth and presence, which is saying like what is true and happening right now. It's a way to just really lean into like, the details of what's going on in us and others and let the rest unfold naturally. Back to that same theme of not liking to use too much structure. Could you say something more about this word truth in this context? Yeah, so usually in relational practice, we're dealing with um, conceptual truth. But I do try to lean people into what do you actually know is true and what are you adding? So what is, if you can give, give voice to, like, I'm noticing there's an assumption that, or um, I'm perceiving it that this, or um, I'm remembering this, or um, whatever it might be as opposed to just I'm feeling angry, something which can be a more direct observation of a present moment tree. And oftentimes, like first few times doing these practices, people are taken aback by how much they're adding on to the reality through like, all of the, the stories and the assumptions that we make. Could you give an example of, of that kind of a realization? Yeah, sometimes, for example, I or this is not, not in news, is very common in this world of relational practices. We can make an invitation to give voice to any judgments that we might be holding about each other. And very often what people say is, 
oh, it's amazing. Oh, there's so many, but now I realize they're just judgments arising and passing away. There's no need to say them anymore. And we all feel safe, bizarrely. We all feel safe in this group of knowing that we're all judging each other. But we've given voice to the fact, oh, okay, that's just my judgments arising. We all feel together, together and united in our judgmental nature. That does, of course, I'm familiar with these these modalities, but it does sound, as you describe it, extremely not British. <laughs> I think it's, I don't know, in London, a lot of this stuff definitely goes on. But yeah, it's not very polite. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been um, so fascinating. You, you talked a bit there about silent retreat versus community and relationship and so on. <clears throat> and you've talked elsewhere also about um, practice in life or off retreat. You've made that distinction in the past and released certain um, teachings about how to develop continual practice in daily life when off retreat. So I'm, I'm wondering how you see that the interaction of those two spheres, retreat practice, it, we could say formal practice perhaps, um, which includes perhaps retreat practice and maybe one's personal practice on the cushion when one's, you know, doing that. And then informal practice, perhaps this is a distinction that's coined by Shinzen Young, uh, a meditation teacher and author in the States. He talks about formal and informal practice. Do you have that kind of a distinction in mind? And how do you see the interaction between, between those retreats? Do you think retreats are outmoded? Is there a reason to do them? Um, and what is it? And how do these two spheres interact in your view? Yeah, so I sort of developed my blueprint for a monastic life. And I think from people who haven't been monastic, sometimes there's a misperception that it's one long retreat, but it's really not. Um, usually we have a, third, a quarter of the year, the rains retreat, three months of the year, which is more like a retreat. And that's not one long silent retreat. It's just more like a retreat and the unnecessary activities are cut but you still do your chores and you still look after your friends if they're sick and you still, you know, speak. Um, and then the rest of the year is much more going on, really. And we do our meditation each day. I trained in a meditation centre, so it was a monastery heavy on the meditation. But there's still, a, well, you're integrating a lot into every day. And so that was sort of my blueprint is that, okay, about a quarter of the time is retreat 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 where you're really just fully in the meditation and the rest of the time you're meditating and doing other things and i think that is it's a very high bar for most lay people to get three months a year on retreat but a lot of my students can get one month a year and Oftentimes, if they ask me, should I take it as three sets of 10 days or one month, they take it as one month because you can get momentum going, you can go deeper. Um, but where I learned and grew the most, well, that's not true, actually. Both are really important. The retreat is really important for you forward, you stretch the forward edge of your practice because all of the conditions are really supportive for you to stay right on the forward edge of your practice. For a you know for a long time and um, then the rest of the time you're integrating and you're making sure that you can apply these things that you've learned in reality which is where the dharma takes place the dharma doesn't take place only in a silent retreat and um, then what i found when i disrobed is basically i needed to continue the same thing but i needed to strengthen needed to build resilience and strengthen my toolkit off the cushion because life outside of the monastery is so much more coarse than daily life in a monastery but it's basically the same thing and it's what i try to teach to my students that are practicing in the daily life so what we found in monastic life is we build up habits of okay every time i need to walk from the nuns community to the monks community along this road. I'm gonna do that with my attention on my meditation object. Every time I walk past this Buddha statue, I'm gonna bow down. Every time that I address this person, 
I'm going to cultivate metta. Every time I'm queuing for my food, I'm going to practice in this way. Every, so the whole space and the whole way of life is filled with Dharma habits. And that's usually what I try to facilitate people in when they're building their practice after a long retreat. And sometimes I do this exercise where we look at the main uses of their time and attention. Maybe you have to spend this long doing emails and this long commuting and this much time with your kids and whatever. And then, okay, what Dharma quality are we going to bring to that? What wise reflection are we going to bring to this? So the whole thing is becoming a Dharma practice. And then what I usually find is the deeper their practice on retreat, the more refined their practice in the daily life. So the more detail they are able to see, the more skill they can bring, the more defilements they can clear up, the more quickly they catch their own mistakes. And then as they continue that practice of the cushion, when they come to retreat, they're just so resilient and strong and ready to go. They're really feeding each other. Now, does that answer the question? Mm, yes, it does. Sometimes people don't believe me that it's possible to practice deeply off retreat, practice jhana or deep vipassana off retreat. And I've heard teachers say that, and it's just not true in my experience, but it is it is a skill set that you need to build. You can't just do a retreat and expect to just go home and it will just be the same. Did you, when you came uh, out of the, the monastery, did you uh, trial, I suppose, different proportions of practice to other activities in, say, a day-to-day -day basis or on a quarterly or yearly basis? Did you try a few things or did you right away find a rhythm that kind of worked for you? No, neither of those. And mm -hmm. I still haven't found a rhythm that works for me because my life is so unstable. So I'm like every few weeks I'm changing place, changing routine, living in somebody else's place in a new retreat center, taking a flight. So I don't have that luxury actually of like settling into a natural rhythm of a daily life. So I have to be much more ad hoc. I have learned the kinds of activities where I get a minute to meditate like if I'm on a commute or on a flight or at an airport or something like that and I'm lucky that I'm my job is to lead retreats so a big chunk of my year is in retreat centers um but no I never had the luxury of making those experiments I'm always like grabbing a moment here and there are you still able to get personal retreat time yes yeah I have to like schedule it in and i find the retreats that i lead good for my own meditation practice as well i make sure i have enough meditation time for myself and i usually practice what the person in front of me is practicing or if we do a group sit then i practice the things because i'm teaching everyone differently so i practice the things that i haven't done for a while or something so i'm fresh on the details but it's very good for me and sometimes they practice in a way I've never done before. And that's great. Like on this hungry retreat I just did, we had somebody doing the red casino, but he wanted to expand it as a cube. <laughs> so I'd never done it before. Like expand, I'd never expanded any casino as a cube before. It's like, oh, thank you. Like what an invitation into something new. And um, another friend of mine, our translator, she wanted to practice the jhana one and a half where you, let go of the Wittaka, but not the Wichara. And I had done that, but like way, way years ago, I hadn't done it for ages. And I never usually teach like it, but she's an Abbey Dhamma geek and she just wanted to know if it's possible. And I was like, oh, thank you. I get to practice the jhana one and a half. So usually my teaching time is quite good for my meditation time as well. That's very interesting. Thank you. The last thing that I'll ask you, and then um, I will, will let you go is, uh, sense restraint as a gift to ourselves that's a quote from you um yeah. uh, it's sort of i think a little bit related to what we're talking about but would you mind saying something about sense re restraint as a gift to ourselves it sounds um almost punitive uh, at first glance um mm -hmm. but you perhaps have to explain what it is but it sounds almost almost punitive or um ascetic uh to uh, so could you say something a bit about sense restraint and why it's a gift to ourselves and how that fits in with all the things we've been discussing today? Yeah, so it's the same as I was saying about leaving McDonald's and going to the Michelin starred restaurant, right? And there's a there's like a, a bit of an uncomfortable period in the middle there where you're in neither and you're, you're going on faith. Um, 
and so it can sound punitive but the, the what the buddha was saying is if you want big happiness you've got to give up small happiness if you want the good food you've got to walk out of mcdonald's and if we can't feel sense restraint as a gift to ourselves if we don't understand oh wait this is me walking towards a higher happiness then we probably need to do some reflection on the gratification and the danger of those sense pleasures so just lean really into experiencing them fully okay what is it that's pleasing to me about this and what is the danger where am i limiting myself here is this really the best that i want for myself and when we're really in tune with that then we can understand oh wait not engaging with these things is love for me i'm going for something better for me and there's some there's some things needed in that step like i said most people don't follow the buddha it's for those with little dust in their eyes we need enough faith we need enough wisdom we need enough wise association but if those things are there then yes we experience sense restraint as elevating ourselves loving ourselves does that answer the question yes and that, is that because that one can see the effect of i suppose unrestrained sensory indulgent indulgence when one meditates one can see it clearly yes. oh, wow oh gosh is that is that the main lens through which one clarifies the effect of restraint versus indulgence so it can come about in a few ways like that disenchantment one is we've got all the sense pleasures that we want and we still don't feel satisfied and something, some faith or something kicks in, there's got to be something more than this. Or well, we've heard about the Buddha just by hearing and we think, maybe that's it, but I know I want something better than this. And this isn't it. And whilst I'm putting all of my time into these sense pleasures, I'm not going to find it. And so we re restrain ourselves. That's one way. Another way is through suffering. So we experience some suffering in our life and we understand it's the flip side of the coin. We're craving all of these pleasures because there's so much unpleasant. And then we understand, wait, this game is not a game that I want to be in anymore. There's got to be something better. If we're really lucky, then the way that we get to transcendence is through, we meet someone that's there and we trust them. We meet a wise association. This is why the Buddha was such a great teacher. This is what happened for me when I met my teachers. We meet someone that's embodying that something better. And we think, wow, that looks better. I'll put down this, I'll go over there. And through inspiration, when we've taken a few steps ourselves along that journey, and we've experienced some something approaching access concentration, maybe where there's not so much hindrances in the mind, then by comparison, we know. Okay, we might forget, but we know there's something better than these sense pleasures. Very interesting. Well, Beth Upton, this has been very fascinating indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a pleasure to have another interview with you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.